Hey there, welcome back to 16 Stops, a podcast. My name is Josh, and I'm here with Brandon. What's up? And in today, in episode 16, we're going to talk about if black magic is phoning it in. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's do this. All right, so uh, hopefully that's enough of an enticement for people to uh, to want to follow along for the rest of the episode. But we have a lot of opinions about black magic, and I feel like not a lot of people are talking about it. So, I think we have set a clear divide in the pro and not pro black magic camps with that title. Absolutely. All right. So first of all, uh, we are back from our trip. We uh, we made the last podcast. Hopefully, everyone got to see that. It was yeah. one of those that was really special for both Brandon and I because we got to do something cool together in person and do the podcast together. And it was a very um, a very cool experience for both of us. Yeah, for sure. 100%. So if you haven't checked that out, please go check it out. It's about our – we worked on this uh, Star Trek film for four days and we got to camera operate and, you know, use our Komodos and we had a ton of fun and hang out with Jeff yeah. and, and the rest of the crew. So uh, – Personal news for me, uh, I've just been kind of trying to crank out YouTube videos whenever I have time and energy to do it. Um, I've been doing a lot of videos about the FX3 and the raw capabilities, which has been really fascinating to me because it's something that's been in the camera since it came out, but people aren't really talking about. So, yeah. Uh, Timely, test- valuable yeah. videos, Josh. Good work. Well, thanks. I mean, I was kind of motivated by all the buzz with the uh, the creator. Creator. A discussion about using the FX3, and I didn't make the standard. Oh, the FX, the creator was made on the FX3, but I was like, I had a feeling people would be more interested in that camera, so I wanted to make some mm-hmm. more content about it. Plus, it's a nice camera work. that I'm keeping, like I'm using for client work. I rely on it. I don't think I'm going to sell it until a replacement for it comes out. It's a camera that is important for me. Smart. So, uh, I also got to test out the Sony A7R5, and I made a video about that. I took that mm-hmm. with me to Atlanta, and you got to play with it a little bit. What were your What were your thoughts like? Just I know you didn't get to use it too much, but you hated it. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just, just not my jam. Uh, There, there are definitely things that I really liked about. I mean, it's like I I like high resolution stuff. So sixty one megapixels, I think it has, or something like that. Like I'm down with that. It was super light, which I liked. But uh, I and the flippy turny screen that they created for that camera is amazing. I wish all cameras had that. But uh, the the screen or the EVF, I think it was the EVF, just just was really gross so i i didn't i didn't care for it it's just not like my cup of tea you know me so yeah yeah i was interested in the new tech in that camera uh with the new ibis and the uh the flippy bendy tilty screen we know it's weird i mentioned this in my video was that whenever we were out uh in lawrenceville and like i put out the camera to my eye and it was like super grainy and like yeah i it was so weird i don't know i don't know i just Yep. I definitely mentioned it in the video. Uh, so anyways, yeah, we're excited to be back back at it making podcasts. We are pumped about it. Episode 16 of 16 Stops. So that's got to be hey. a milestone. <laughs> um, all right. So I guess on to everyone's favorite segment. What did we buy? Mm-hmm. All right. So first of all, I bought a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera <laughs> 6K G2. So... Ooh which is what I'm filming on right now. I have been on the hunt for a, I'll say cheap, uh, studio camera because I've been using C70s, R5Cs, the Komodo, the FX3. I'm using cameras that are like $4,000 plus. Mm -hmm. And the 6K G2 is is on sale, or at least was recording this, for $1,600, which is pretty crazy. And I've owned the 6K a while ago, but I didn't wind up keeping it. Um, And I'm really excited about the image. I know we've talked a lot about Blackmagic offline, independent of me trying to purchase this camera, but that's kind of what spearheaded our motivation to make this episode. So Mm -hmm. we're going to talk more about that. But I'm really, for $1,600, I think the image quality that comes out of this camera is like way better than a lot of cameras, even remotely in that price range. I would agree. Lots lots of limitations with the black magic 6k but uh for what i'm doing here um i don't even need autofocus in the studio so it's been working out um brandon what have you picked up anything i know you got a loner that's pretty special but yeah i I didn't i didn't buy anything but i do have a loner uh it's on the table uh basically it's a one of one which is absolutely bananas the company let me borrow this camera for three weeks, and it is literally the only one on the planet. So I'm going to be doing a video. I just got back from a crazy tour of some of the most unusual, amazing places in Utah with my buddy Joey Helms. 
So I used that camera to film some of it. There's no YouTube videos on shooting with a camera like that. So it was one giant experiment, but I'm really excited to, uh, to share that video here in a couple weeks. And it was scary because it is one of one. And I was like, you know, the, the person that let me borrow it was like, you know, so no pressure, don't break it. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> so uh, obviously being really vague, but that's cool. We'll uh, we'll talk about it in depth. Uh, I know you're gonna make a yeah. video, but we might make a podcast I'm, about I'm it I'm being too. vague because I didn't ask them, like, how much do you want me to share? I don't know, like, how okay. much of a, you know, is this a hush-hush type of thing? Because they were like, you don't have to do anything with this camera if you don't want to. There's zero pressure. But getting them involved or whatever, like, I, I just don't know how much they want to be involved yet. So uh, that will be run by them. And if they're like good to go, maybe we'll do like a podcast on it or something. Cause it is pretty, it's kind of a wild story and a wild camera. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you could have just been like, yeah, we're just teasing this so you guys can watch the next episode, but you know, you <laughs> just kidding with you. All right. Uh, so any, any more progress with your SL lens selections or how's that going with SL2 by the way? Have you figured that out yet? It's just that lens. That lens will probably live on it. I I am so grateful that I got to shoot this video with Joey. But what what was also cool, somebody that I followed for a really long time uh, from my Fuji XT3 days, Gadgen, uh, actually came to Utah, and I got to shoot with him. He had the uh, Leica 50, the brand new one with the the better close focus distance. So I got to try that one, and it's a phenomenal lens. Maybe in the future, that's something I would pick up 6-bit. Close focus is so much better on it. But right now, just shoot with the 50 F2 from Voigtlander. I love that lens. So cool. that's it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, moving on to news and rumors. Let's go. So I feel like we always start with Canon and Sony. So I'm purposely not starting with Canon and Sony. Let's talk yeah. about some other stuff. You know? Yeah, let's talk about Sony. No, we're not going to talk about them later. Let's not talk about them <laughs> We have to talk okay. about Sony. They always have new cameras, so they, they yeah, like yeah. you know they make it in every episode. You know, they're like, uh, "What did we buy?" It's like, "What did Sony release? <laughs> what camera did?" That's a new section. What camera did we, Sony release this week? We can't have too many segments. It's going to lose a lot of control. Okay, yeah, that's true. but yeah, but yeah, that's definitely part of the news and rumors. Maybe it should be slash what did Sony release or something like that. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Lumix. Um, this was a couple weeks ago now, I think. I don't know how much we talked about it, but or if we did, but the G92, I just want to mention. Did we talk about this in the last episode? I don't, I don't th think we did. I don't think we did. I want to talk about it because Micro Four Thirds gets no love, and Lumix is coming out with cool cameras, and I think they're mm -hmm. setting up themselves to be much more competitive in the video space in the next few years. So this is like an S5 II, but with a Micro Four Thirds sensor. It shoots 75 frames per second in for stills. Did you know that? <laughs> I didn't know that. That is insane. Um, that is insane. Yeah, so it also does 5.8K open gate in 10-bit 420, up to 30 frames per second. Uh, you can shoot uh, 4K 120, um, and there, like, there's crazy video specs. You can do long op and all eye internal. Yeah. You can also record ProRes to an SSD. It of course has insane IBIS. It has the phase detect autofocus from the S5 II and the S52X. So it's like a pretty serious camera. Uh, yeah. But I, I don't. People don't really talk much about Micro Four Thirds. At least I don't hear people talking much about it. Yeah, definitely not in the video sector. You know, like you're usually getting. You know, APS-C, Super 35, or, or full frame. But from a photography standpoint, a lot of people still use them. I mean, there's a lot of advantages, which is kind of weird considering that this camera is no smaller than their full frame S5 Mark II. And the lenses are getting bigger, which is also a huge disadvantage. I mean, like when I first started looking at Micro Four Thirds, it was because I could just pack so much smaller. So anyway, but I mean, like as far as like Micro Four Thirds cameras go, I I don't think it could be beat right now. Yeah, I agree. I really want to try one, and I might ask to borrow one because I'm really intrigued for it for wildlife, and I think that's mm -hmm. a huge advantage if you're yeah. shooting sports and wildlife because it's going to be a quick readout probably on the sensor, uh, and you get so much reach. And they also announced yep. two new lenses, a new 100 to 400. Um, and that's a Panasonic Leica lens. So I'm, okay. from what I've seen, the optics are great. Now that's, when you think about 100 to 400, that becomes a 200 to 800 when you're thinking about yeah. full frame equivalents. 
and it's only like just over two pounds. So that's small. It's very small, and it's sixteen hundred dollars. And uh, I don't know how much Mike is involved with it, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, who knows? I was just gonna say if if you want to learn more, a photographer I follow. His name's James Popsis. He's yeah, the James British guy. Awesome. I love yeah. James. He's got the yeah. funniest sense of humor. He just did a video on the G92 and the advantages and disadvantages. So, uh, like, not to throw some random person in there, but it's a great video on the subject. Yeah, I've been following James for years. I don't want, get to watch all his videos, but um, I know he was shooting on the G9 forever before switching mm -hmm. around, but he was a big proponent of Micro Four Thirds and stuff. So yeah, uh, definitely definitely go check out his channel. Uh, they also announced a new 35 to 100 f2.8 lens for oh, cool. Micro Four Thirds. So that's a little bit cheaper. It's 1150. So when you think about size and price and weight, like there still is an advantage there for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if I were to carry on a 200 to 800 full frame lens, you know how big that would be? It's, it's a chunk. Yeah. It's a big so, one. And the price and, would be ridiculous. Yeah. So I am I really want to try out that new 100 to 400 on the G9 All right. too. So that would be really cool. Because I am I have a very small lens for my wildlife. I have that RF 100 to 500. But it's mm -hmm. still, like, it's it's serious. Like, that's a big thing you're yeah. carrying around, you know? Yep. Big, um, heavy and it, lens. And it, in addition to big, big lenses, Nikon came out with their 600 millimeter F6.3. So, you know, that there's it's a cool option. It's for a 400 mm or 600 millimeter prime, it's not as fast as the F4s, but the price matches that at 4800. It's not like a $12,000 lens. It exists. It exists. Uh all right, so Sony rumors. Uh we got the A93. Here we go. How's the the list? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh there're more and more rumors coming about the Sony A93 maybe being announced in November. I'm really excited about that and be really curious about how many megapixels they put in there. It's going to be insanely fast and the price is going to be a big question mark. And how it eats into the A1 a little bit, I think is going to be like how much do they keep it away from the A1? Yeah, so I don't think Sony cares that much anymore. They're just like, throw the new tech in it. You know, our faith yeah. will be damned. And it seems like every time they come up with a new sort of like, not a flagship, but like the leader of each of those categories, you know, like mm -hmm. the A7R5 or whatever. Like, I feel like they're gonna be, there's gonna be some new tech in there that then we'll see in every other camera after that. You know what I mean? That's yeah. kind of what they've been doing. So yeah. always cool to see it. Um, I'm 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 really curious about the megapixels because for the longest time the the sports and wildlife fast action cameras were like 24 26 megapixels like the 1DX the R3 yeah. the A9 A92 and now we have an A1 that shoots 50 megapixels at 30 frames per second. Do you need the like low resolution anymore? Like, you know what I mean? I mean, technology has got us to the point where you don't. And there's there are you know obviously there are disadvantages for having a lots and lots of megapixels, but there are some really cool advantages advantages especially if you're a sports or wildlife shooter so yeah uh there is also a rumor about a sony 300 f 2.8 gm so okay yeah and then maybe some other bodies coming soon i know andrea from sony alpha rumors just keeps talking about reading all the um how they're registering cameras in china and trying to figure out what cameras they are so I don't know. They don't really know. Maybe an A7S4. Uh, I don't think that or the A1 Mark II, but who knows? So yeah, something. Just wait. I'm just waiting on the FX3 Mark II. That's that's the one that's got me hyped. Yeah, I, I think we're gonna. Be, I think it's gonna be a while. I think they're gonna milk that sensor a little bit longer. You know, I'm sure okay. they'll come out in three to four more dozen cameras. You know, the ZVE1 Mark II <laughs> and three will be out before that camera. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see. Um, so in addition to that, let's, let's get on talking about Canon. Uh, one thing is the EOS M line, I guess, was officially discontinued. Did you hear about this? I guess <laughs> quietly. That could just, be a whole other episode, man, talking about the EOS M line. That was just an interesting thing that Canon did. Yeah, that was the stepchild of Canon. <laughs> to all you stepchildren out there. <laughs> that's that's the title of that, that episode. The EOS M yeah. stepchild of Canon. Um, yeah. So the RF 10 to 20 F4 LIS was announced. Yeah, so, so that, that's that's a wide freaking lens. Ten millimeters on full frame, stabilized. Um, I don't, I don't know who's gonna. That's a crazy. That's a really niche lens, man. I know. I like that. Might I, I mean because it's wide, it's small, it's pretty light. That would be fun for FPV. Okay, uh, the one like if you thing threw that on a Komodo, jeez. Well, that, I think that's actually a better crop sensor lens. Than it is a oh, lens. I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm yeah. just. I'm thinking like 
for a full frame or something like that, it would be kind of fun. It would be fun, yeah, for sure. I think for that, that actually makes a lot of sense to me for like a, a C70 if you're doing like real estate or something mm-hmm. like that. Because that would give you like 15, 16, uh, you know, on the Super 35. But it's a full frame lens. It's also $2,300. So yeah. I don't know. All right. Uh, there, I just heard a rumor today about Canon coming up with a 200 to 800 uh, variable aperture zoom lens that's not L, so it'll be like lighter and cheaper. I, that's a oh, wild okay. rumor. We'll see. Uh, All right. More, more rumors flying about the R1. It's looking like that's coming out sometime next year before the Olympics, like we all predicted. Yeah. No yep. specifics really yet from what I can see. I'm just, I, I'm just again, interested to see the tech that's in there because Canon's going to throw something crazy in there. I, I sure hope. I sure hope. I hope they're again. I keep wondering, like, hey, when me and Joey actually talked about this, it's like, when is a company just going to be like, f it, let's just make the ultimate camera, regardless of what it costs, and let's see what happens. And I and I say that because it seems like most companies could do that, and they go, well, it, the 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 way they approach it is, we need a camera for this segment, and so they make the price, and then they build it accordingly rather than just throwing everything at the camera and seeing what happens, I'm sure they'll lose money. But then that tr- that tech trickles down into other things, which is always cool. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be that. I think it's, again, going to be mainly a photography camera, but yep. also going to have crazy video specs. Like, it's going to be like a 1DX. It's going to be like a better version of the R3, in my opinion. I sure hope so. I'm curious about the price. I think, like, you know, it's going to be See, interesting. That's... That's the thing. I I think if they just went, F it, let's just make like a $10,000 camera, you know, an $8,000 camera, like something so much higher than everything else. And just put everything in there. Just put everything in it. I would would love to see a camera company take that approach for at least one crazy camera. But no, in Canon, they're probably not going to. Yeah. I mean, the A1 was pretty close, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think A1 was, was pretty gnarly. But... Yeah, we'll see. All right, I not bet much. Sony could have done more. Yeah, yeah, uh, and they bet you they will in the next round. Uh, yep. I haven't heard much about the R5 II lately. Those rumors have just quieted down. So who knows? Yeah. There's a, there's also a rumor about maybe an RFS 10 to 18. So like the original EFS oh, okay. 10 to 18, but in RF. Yeah. That's a great lens for crop sensor cameras for vlogging, uh, that kind Absolutely. of stuff. But um, hopefully there's new optics in that. <laughs> that lens wasn't incredibly good optically. Yeah, maybe Canon will pull the CNE route and just throw the same <laughs> lens in an RF body. Eh, it worked the first time. I, I still think they're going to start taking the EFM lenses and put RF uh, mounts on them. Hmm, okay. You heard it already here like, first, folks. They're, they're already mirrorless lenses. You know, they could take that like 22, right? Or mm-hmm. and then The what, 22 have... F2 is such a good little lens. Yeah. Uh, all right, so Leica came out with a couple lenses. Uh, the mm-hmm. SL 14 to 24 f 2.8 at $2,500, and the SL 21 mil f 2 for $5,500. Yeah. I don't really have let much of a ch- on those. Let me check my couch. <laughs> Look I'm for sure some I've coins in there. $5,500. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't tried SL optics, but from when I ask my. My friends who've used SL glass, they're like, dude, it's like optimi- optically like the best glass they've ever shot on. So it'd be fun to try, but there are huge lenses generally. Like the SL50 1.4 is a massive freaking 50. And it's also yeah. like seven grand. So. Yeah. And also the like uh, the Leica certified lenses for Lumix, like their mm-hmm. S-Pro lenses are also massive, but also really good optically. So... Yeah, they're not they're not messing around. You're getting prime <laughs> optics with those guys. Yep. All right. So uh, I guess the last new release, which leads us into discussion, is really the new Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K. And so let's get into talking about Blackmagic a little bit. And of course, we'll talk about that camera in particular. I think that's kind of what motivated us to have this discussion because there's been a yeah. lot of chatter in the community about this camera, about Blackmagic in general, about what this camera means for Blackmagic. Uh, and I so that's what we're going to get into. Um, First, I want to talk a little bit about the history of Blackmagic. I don't want to go too in-depth with this because I don't really know. I don't have experience with a lot of these cameras. This is A lot of this was before my time, before I was into video. And mm-hmm. we're going to focus in this discussion about some of the smaller bodies. So we're not going to talk about the Ursas and the broadcast cameras and all that kind of stuff. So the reason I want to 
talk about this is to give it a little bit of context for the rest of the discussion. So in 2012, they came up with the first camera, the Blackmagic Cinema Camera, which was Micro Four Thirds, 2.5K, $3,000. From what I understand, was crazy at the time. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't into video at the time, but... Me neither. Made a splash. Uh, the next year, in 2013, they came up with the production camera 4K, which was a Super 35 global shutter camera for four grand. I remember that one. It's so, kind of bananas. That's kind of bananas to think about. That's 10 years ago, and we're still talking about Super 35 global shutter cameras mm -hmm. and, like, how that's a big deal. Uh, and then 2013, which I think was probably the camera that gets thought about the most in terms of the older one was the pocket cinema camera. And that's the 1080p micro four thirds, thousand dollars, tiny body. And I think a lot of people are still trying to get their hands on those to make like cool films because it has a very unique look to it. Yeah. Have you used any of these cameras, Brandon? Just, just the, uh, just the pocket cinema cameras, the 4k. I, I had a 4k for a really short time and I really liked the image that came out of that camera, the micro four thirds one. And then I had a 6K Pro. Okay. And we'll get on to talking about our experience with those. So uh, in 2018, yeah. they came out with the... Sorry, 2016, they came with the Micro Cinema Camera, which was an interesting that was release. A, that was a really cool camera because it was so small. So, I mean, like, so tiny. Did that one also have a global shutter? I don't know. Okay. But it had, like, a pretty loyal fan base. Like, those... Like, people have been chomping at the bit for a new one we'll, we'll talk about the new one so yeah it's kind of like the cult classics of the black magic world right yeah for sure all right so they got into the pocket cinema cameras in 2018 with the pocket cinema camera 4k which came out mm -hmm. for 1300 dollars. i think still sells for 1300 dollars. yeah you don't have to pay that obviously no, no. <laughs> you can get a used one but and i would still say it's probably worth that that 1300 bucks yeah even today and, yeah and so the idea with the pocket cameras was like you don't need a lot of extra stuff, although you kind of do, but you can throw a battery in there. Technically, it won't last more than like 10 minutes, but you could throw a battery <laughs> in there. You could put a memory card in the camera, right? You can you can roll yeah. with it pretty minimal, and I think that's the whole idea with the pocket cameras, but they're not really pocketable. Like, they're pretty big, so yeah, they finally took yeah, that name off the new one. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're weirdly shaped, like, yeah. Plastic footballs, as some of us like to call them. Um, yeah. so 2019, the, the pocket cinema camera 6k came out and I do remember when this one was released because I know a lot of YouTubers were talking about it. Uh, yeah. super 35, $2,500 for a 6k camera that shoots B raw pro res, um, got a lot of hype. I think a lot of people bought them and then probably didn't need to buy them and like, didn't know what to do with them. Cause you know, we don't have autofocus and stuff like that. Um, and then 2021 came out with the 6k pro, which was an improved version of the 6k we got ND filters, we got a flip up screen, we got a second XLR port, really add a lot of functionality to the camera, but essentially the same camera. Yeah, yeah. And then lastly, it had its, its last iteration, which came out last year in 2022, the Pocket Cinema Camera 6K G2, <laughs> they have the best names. Yep. And again, same as the 6K Pro, but no NDs, the screen's a little bit less bright. Yeah. And that's what I'm shooting on, so. Um, yeah. kind of a cheaper option. And I think they did they discontinue the original 6K? I don't think you can get that anymore, right? Yeah, I don't think so either. Okay. So you shot on the 4K and the 6K Pro brand. And what were some of the things that sort of brought you into using those and you sort of your experiences with them? Well, the 6K Pro was my first cinema camera. I wanted to get into the workflow of cinema cameras. And so I got a 6K Pro because just for the money, like oh, so hard to beat what that camera was offering from the IO to the image. And I loved it. It wasn't a great camera to be behind the lens, but if you were operating the camera, it was amazing. Like the super bright screen and D filters. And I really enjoyed it. And there's something magical about that sensor for sure. And I wanted kind of a backup. I loved how easy it was to live stream on that camera. I loved how easy it was to set up like presets so I could switch between lives and just regular shooting. And so I bought a 4K to kind of be that second camera angle uh, and they would match and I really loved it. And then one thing I started doing with the 4K was I started taking photos on it. Like not a lot of people take photos on the Black Magics because it's not easy with shutter speed and like the workflow. 
but some of my favorite photos I've ever got was with the Suray 1.33s on that uh, Micro Four Thirds, the 4K. Love taking photos on them. So they were they were an awesome introduction into cinema cameras for me, and yeah, I loved using them. They were just super awkward. There were enough like cons that I was like, okay, I need to move directions, but. Yeah. Okay, you brought up a lot of points in there. First of all, they're they're doing uh, tree work next door, and I don't know if you can hear the I wood can, chipper. I can, I can hear it. And I'm like, <laughs> what is that noise? Yeah, it's unfortunate, but this is when we have time to record. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, a lot of things there. I think the biggest things to take away is image quality. If you never shot with a Blackmagic camera, it has a certain look to it that's very unique to Blackmagic. And every time that I see people and their images they make with Blackmagic cameras that use them on a regular basis, it has a cool look to it that's unique. And super color so super color accurate just a really pleasing sort of more filmic image uh you can it's a good starting point because you can use funky lenses you can use all sorts of other stuff to make the image that you want and the camera image just kind of gets out of the way and uh like you said io is good like for me like having a full-size hdmi you can plug power in directly to it like i didn't need any accessories to use this for my studio camera i literally put a lens on it and it came with the power adapter and like you're good to go, and you can record to an SSD if you don't have CFast cards. It does a lot, for yeah. sure. So it does a lot. So some of the issues that we have with the cameras, Brandon, of course, like it has a lot of power to it, but also if you want to use it for going out and shooting or other kinds of production, there there are some strategies that you have to do, some things you have to deal with. So what are some of those things that you sort of had to overcome to make it a little bit more usable? For me. The ergonomics were a challenge. Ergonomics were a challenge. Like packing this thing into a bag with like, you know, your lenses. It was like, it's big. It's not pocket. Like the 6K Pro, because at the time I also had the battery pack to give it the necessary battery uh, power that I wanted. Because I didn't have like a V-mount solution at the time. I later got like an Anton Bauer, like the base plate solution. And that worked really well. But at the time I had like the... The, what do we call them? The grip, the battery grip, which, I mean, the camera ended up being like this big, but because you couldn't flip out the screen, if I ever wanted to shoot myself or something like that, then I had to take a monitor. So it was mostly like workflow challenges that the cameras, like if you're behind the camera and shooting something else, that's one of the most easy, pleasurable shooting experiences you get. Monitor super bright. So you don't need a monitor. The menu is absolutely amazing. Amazing. So, like, I'm an idiot. And it was so easy for me to just, like, click, 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 hear all the things. Setting up presets was absolutely amazing. The high frame rate button was a godsend. I loved that camera, but I just found myself needing to shoot me so often. That's why I went in a different direction. Yeah, for me, it was never a camera I could even consider because it doesn't have autofocus and you can't yeah. flip the screen out. So as a content creator and spent the first bunch of years filming myself most of the time that was never a camera that I could really get behind and having to rig it up and get a bigger yeah. battery and like I like to keep things kind of minimal. I've also yeah. heard a lot about the you know the build quality. I want to talk about that for a second too because it's very plasticky. I feel yeah. like if you dropped it it would not be a good ending for the camera. Um, I've also heard when they shipped them there were issues with screens not working and you know stuff like yeah. that where there was just like quality control issues. So I definitely remember when the 6K Pro came out because that, I mean, that was the first one I invested into. So I was really invested into it and I got super lucky. I got one that didn't have any temperature issues, but I remember like Potato Jet did one. Lots of people did it. It's screen was like super blue. Like it had like a really blue. And so they had to come out with a firmware update that like recalibrated the screen and made it easy to do that. But yeah, I mean, Black Magic is basically like, hey, here's the best image quality, all the cool stuff. But in order to keep the cost down, we got to go real cheap on parts and a and a few other things. And I think that's why I wouldn't buy a used. It would be tough to be used because most of them are pretty beat up. Yeah, I was looking when I was going to buy this camera. I started looking. I was like, oh, I could probably get like a 6K Pro used for just about the same price or maybe a little bit more. And then I started looking and every single person I talked to was like, this thing's broken. This thing's missing. Yeah. Like, And I'm just like, oh, I, I got, I should probably buy a new one. So that's what I wound up doing. Yeah. Um, so uh, one thing that I've, my first impressions about using the 6K G2 is 
in some ways I feel like it's a cheaper version of a red camera. And I don't mean this to like, like make anything like anyone upset about anything, but like as a yeah. red Komodo user, when I use the 6K, I kind of feel like it does a lot of that stuff. It has a similar feel to it as being a, a videographer or filmmaker. You get to yeah. shoot in B-RAW, which is not the same as R3D. I understand that. But you have a lot of control over the image. It really does provide a really nice image, a lot of depth. The color science is awesome. Like, mm -hmm. I prefer skin tones and stuff over Canon and Sony. Uh, I still think red wins, in my opinion, for that, the way I yeah. like it. Uh, but I kind of feel like if I didn't, if I wanted to get a really cool cinema camera and didn't have enough money to buy a Komodo, I think the 6K or 6K Pro is still an awesome option, even after it's 100%. been out for a few years. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it gives you a very similar experience. Not the same experience, but a very similar one. Yeah, and you get a lot more with RED. Obviously, the build quality, and you get the 16-bit R3D, and all of the things that we don't need to get into, global shutter. You know, there's a lot more to that camera, but I think for a lot of people who are either on a serious budget or maybe just getting into this but really want a powerful camera that they're willing to work with some of the you know, workarounds and, and struggles with the camera, like, can get a very powerful image. I was just thinking, like, if you grab two 6K G2s and a couple lenses and a couple lights and a microphone, like, you could absolutely crush it for, like, five grand. Oh, 100%. Like like I said, I, I hard to beat that camera for value. I mean, Lumix is now getting close with the S5 Mark IIs. Yeah. But hard, hard to beat Blackmagic... When it comes to when it comes to image quality and value and all the cool shit they give you. Okay, and so we're talking about bang for your buck here. We're talking about getting the most image quality out of a camera for the money. And I think there's a lot of people think of black magic as being a disruptor. I feel like a lot of people use that term a lot. Uh, Brandon, what do you think is behind that that thought about black magic? I I mean, I would I would agree with that. Yeah, me too. I mean, you know, they've always kind of pushed the boundary at a very cheap price point i mean we'll probably get into this a little bit later it's not going to be the main topic but just look at like davinci resolve the fact that they give you such a powerful editing tool for free when you buy one of these cameras and how rapidly davinci resolve is just separating itself from every other nle when it comes to like what it's capable of you, i mean you can see it their fingerprints of being a disruptor are all over their products yeah, and for me, it just in the, since like 2018, 2019, when I started getting interested in this stuff, I remember when the 6K came out, and I was like, you can buy a 6K cinema camera for $2,500? That was unheard yeah. of at the time. It just was like, sh it shaked, shook, shaked everything up. Um, yeah. So I think as someone in the community, like when we think about Blackmagic, we think of them as disruptors. So when they come out with a camera that maybe doesn't disrupt as much, we're kind of let down. Yeah, I can see where you're going with this. Okay, how's that segue? <laughs> so let's yeah, that's, a, that's a beautiful segue, Josh. I'm trying, I'm trying here, man. So let's talk about the new Cinema Camera 6K. So they removed the pocket out of this. They've finally uh -huh. said, okay, we don't have a pocket big enough to put this camera in. So they got that nomenclature out of there. Although Jenko jeans are coming back in a style. Those were some pretty damn big pockets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess they didn't specify normal pocket size. Okay, yeah, yeah. so... Let's talk about a couple of the headline features and then we're gonna dive into this. So first of all, full frame. So that's a yep. huge deal because as of now, their largest sensor was Super 35. Yeah. Um, they took out the ND filters, which yep. I think a lot of people are upset about, myself included. Yeah. But from what I've heard in terms of their justification, they said that they couldn't fit their ND system inside with the L mount, L -mount. because yeah. of the flange distance. and. You know that they can get an ND filter in mirrorless mounts, but they probably just didn't have the the money or, or R and D to redesign their ND filter to fit in that in that flange yeah. distance. Is my guess. I wonder if because they went to L mount, that there there's also some restrictions. Like I wonder who has the rights to do the ND system first. I wonder if there's even a thing like that. You know what I mean? They're the newcomer to L mount. I wonder if there's anything where Leica or somebody else was like, eh, you're, you were the last one in, so you're going to be the last one that gets the internal ND. So-and-so gets it first. I wonder if there's anything like that. 
That's a great thought. Um, I always think about Elmount as like open source. It's like, oh, you want to be in? You can even come and hang out. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think like, of it as an HOA. <laughs> what do you mean? No, you have to. No, I don't think it was an HOA. I don't think about that at all. It's kind of like a bonfire. Everyone can come and like hang out to, and have and have a party together. You know. Okay. Well, um, then Lord of the Flies. Yeah. So, but I think that's an interesting point. Uh, but I think I really do think it's a matter of like they didn't have. The funding or R and D to like re-engineer their ND because their ND filter yeah. system is pretty clunky, and they were able to do that because of the EF mount on the 6K mm-hmm. Pro. There's a lot of space in there to do that. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Or the flange distance on L mount. So let's talk about L mount because I know we already talked about it. But good idea, bad idea, going with L mount. I think it's a great think? idea. I personally think it's a great idea. Like I love how many options you have on the RF mount and the L mount is the same. I mean, you can pretty much adapt anything to it. So I'm stoked for it. Okay. So I'm a big fan that they put a mirrorless mount. So like mm-hmm. you were saying RF, but could they have put RF? Could they have put E? Could they have put, you know, like Nikon? I don't know why they put Nikon on there, but it, I I'm mean, sh- <laughs> I'm sure they could have gone another route, but do you really want to be RF mount right now? Well, so everyone assumed RF because they've been EF for so long. So a lot of the Black mm-hmm. Magic users have Canon lenses, right? Yeah. And they just assumed RF. But like, if you go back and th- I heard an interview with someone, they're like, the reason why we chose EF was because everyone had EF lenses. Like, EF had been around for so long, it was a great yeah. system for us to adopt. But L mount is more open source. Like, there's more companies that are kind of like working together on it. Yeah, that's what I, I mean. I- I also wonder how much Canon was going to charge for the RF mount as well. I bet you Elmont was like, oh, you went into the party? Here you go. Yeah, yeah. It's like a small cover fee with the L mount and the RF, like, wants your firstborn child to enter the club. <laughs> I feel like that's probably the case. I don't know. I don't yeah. know the details about how that stuff works, but um, <laughs> but it's cool. I mean, a lot of people were curious about this. And, and like Brandon said, having a mirrorless mount means you can literally adapt to almost any lenses. You can use EF, PL, yeah. you know, whatever you want. So I think that's cool. Um, another thing is open gate recording, which I'm really excited about because I feel like every camera should have this moving forwards. And yep. it's not just for making vertical videos. It's also great for anamorphic support because you can get higher yeah. squeeze um, lenses. It just gives you so much more flexibility. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully, hopefully one day all camera manufacturers will come together and form one cohesive alliance where they all make open gate sensors. Okay, I'm. I want them all to have open gate sensors, but I want the company separate for competition. I'm just gonna say that. Well, I just mean like a mutual agreement, like a okay. ceasefire for open gate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully they're like, oh, all these guys are doing it. Maybe I should do it. Like keep up yeah. with the keep keep up with the times. Yeah, there's here. an accord. It's the yeah. Sokovia yeah. Accords. <laughs> So they put an OLPF in there, which was awesome. I'm, I like having OLPFs, the optical low pass filters, in there to help it's reduce good for uh, skin more tones. Um, so they advertised it as having 13 stops of dynamic range, which doesn't sound good on paper, but yeah. I think 13 stops probably is 13 stops. Unlike everyone else who says they're 16 and then is really 12 and a half. They do a good job of being accurate. I mean, like. The dynamic range that I got out of the 6K Pro was wicked good. You know, I wasn't like, oh, this sucks. So, yeah. Continues on I, with some of the other features. We got a dual base ISO of 400 and 3200. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get up to, so one one criticism about these cameras is the high frame rate. So, yeah. in the 6K open gate, you can only shoot 36 frames per second. You can get mm-hmm. up to 48 and 60 with a couple of different options. But it's not but blisteringly it, fast. It's, the, yes. you know, we're not, we don't have 4K 120. We don't, have, you know, there's, there's some things where it's like, gosh, I wonder why that is. I wonder what's preventing them from going that route, but. Probably just on. development and R&D and like, yeah. you know, they're probably reusing a lot of the same tech they've been using for the last four years or five years yeah. with these cameras. So Josh. in addition to higher frame rates. Oh, I was I was just gonna say like I know we also we lost high frame rates, but we also lost ProRes, which is kind of that's true. I forgot to mention that. Which yeah. is kind of which is kind of brutal. Like because I'm not a DaVinci Resolve person, I used just the ProRes when I had it, and I loved it. So for me, I'm kind of like, oh, that sucks. Like there's no ProRes yeah, anymore. And that's interesting because right now I'm actually recording in ProRes because 
I am I had it in Final Cut Pro and I started yeah. when I got the camera, I started recording in B Raw. And there is a really nice plugin that you can buy for like 80 bucks. It works great. But yeah. it's kind of clunky and it's like a workaround. It's not completely native. You have to yeah. like bring it in and then tr like hit a button and then drag it over and then I've so done you that. can't and it yeah. was rough. <laughs> it's rough. And I'm like, for me, like I this shot's the same every time, so ProRes works really well and also edits so nice uh mm -hmm. in Final Cut. So that was a big omission for sure. Um, they also yeah. changed the cards because there, there used to be a CFast and SD. Now, is it just CFB, CF Express B? That's what I th that's what I thought it was. Is just okay. CF Express Type B, but so it, you can still record it, uh, SSDs, SSD. SSD, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. But taking out ProRes was kind of an interesting move. I think that that is yep. yeah for sure. Um, yeah. So as I said before, like one thing we were uh, thinking they left out, of course, the NDs, higher frame rates. Another thing a lot of people were critical about was the physical design of the camera. People were livid about the, the no box I was design. one of them. <laughs> I, I think me, you, and Tyler all watched the release. And when he brought it out from underneath the table, I was like, God damn it. I was so mad. I was like, what the hell? Like you had one job and it was making a box. That's what we've been asking for the last like three years. I can't wait till they put this in a box. Everybody would have given you so much money had you given us the exact same thing in a box. And the you same thing was like, like that's so easy. <laughs> that like if they were like the new 6K, like what do we need? And it's literally just one box. It's a box. Just make it a check that one off the board. That's all they needed to do. And somehow <sighs> I saw some great so posts hot. on social media. I saw some great posts on social media like, you had one job, and it's like just the picture of a box, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, so I think there was a lot of talk about that with the C70. We had rumors about like the C200 Mark II or whatever we're yeah. going to call it this year. And then we're like, it's going to be a box camera. So, so for the people that are watching this, maybe don't understand this. Why is having a box camera like so sought after? Okay, well, listen, if you have a box camera, like a Komodo. I like box cameras, but let's yeah, explain if it. If you have a box camera, like a Komodo, and you compare that to the plastic football of the 6K, you're like, which one do I want to hold and put in a backpack or a bag? That's easy. It's the box. It's, it's modular. It's, like, meant to be, like, stripped up. Or, or sorry, built up and stripped down. It's just so much easier to work with. Here's here's another thing. Like they already had a blueprint. They have the micro cinema camera, the little boxy micro cinema. It's like, just make it a little bit bigger. Just just grow it a little bit, water it, fertilize it, and then you, you're done. Game over. Yeah, I think, yeah. And so of course they have justification because they know there was gonna be a bunch of pushback and they're like, well, it's the same design, so if you already own a 6K, you can use all the same accessories. Like that was don't give you know me that I mean? shit. It like comes down to the mount. <laughs> comes down to a mount. Like, is it, small rig already has a cage for that damn thing? If you make it a box, small rig like hit you up, and they're like, we can make one in 20 minutes. And then there's a small rig cage with a handle that you got. No, it really comes down to like we've used the same design, and we could save so much freaking money if we just slap a new sensor and a new mount on this body. But yeah, and it is a little smaller because it doesn't have the EF flange distance. Like the, it is a little yeah. smaller than the 6K Pro and 6K, you know, G2. But yeah, yeah. whatever. I I think what they said in that, which I I agree with you. What you we just with your little rant there about that. But you know, like for them, they were like, oh, we're already switching mounts. Like we don't want to switch the. You know, it's like come on, guys. Like everyone wanted the box camera. So Our, here's my here's my question, Josh. Here's my question. The title of this. You know, this episode was, did Black Magic phone it in? That's the question. Is this all a ploy to then release, like, the Black Magic Cinema Camera Pro, where they do come out with a box, and then they put the ND filters in it, and they do all this other stuff? Yeah, I, I don't think so. But I, Yeah, I don't <laughs> think so either. I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> but I, we are going to talk more about the future of Blackmagic, we're going to see in the future. I want, I do want to finish this uh, thing yeah. about the camera. So what are the other things that are missing? Uh, no autofocus, no stabe, um, which I don't care about stabe, but like autofocus would have been nice, man. Yeah. Can I, t here's another omission that blew my mind. Yeah. Probably the, the coolest 
for me, this is like the coolest thing and I use it all the time and it saves my ass. The app that you have on the Komodo and like the other DSMC3 Reds is just a godsend. It makes it so nice to do everything when you're behind the camera. When Black Magic like brought out the phone and they started talking about the app, I'm like, sweet, I, we yes. can control cameras. And then I was like, wait, it's just an app to shoot on your phone? Like, that doesn't give you any control over the camera? I was like, what the F? Like, <laughs> yeah, that I was, seems like that, a massive oversight to me. Yeah, that whole uh, product announcement, I know we were all texting during while we were watching that, and we were just like, wait, uh, they're going to do it. We're going to have, like, app control. No, it's just, yeah. yeah. So, like, right now I'm using the, I forget what it's called, the Bluetooth Plus app. It's like a third-party app. It's like yeah. five bucks. It works great. Yeah, but it's better than the Black Magic app, which you can control like four things on it. So and yeah. no live preview and all that stuff. And if you haven't used Bla uh, Red's control app, like it is, like Dude, it, it changes your life, man. Like it's so good. It, <laughs> I used it so so much uh, when I was out on that road trip. Like it was just so like I would set up a camera like forty feet from me, sit in my car, just play with. <laughs> I was like, this is easy. You, so you have live preview, but the other thing is you can work the entire menu, which is like... Yeah, you can do you anything can, from it. Anything. So anyways, I, that would have been cool. Um, no. Other thoughts on the new camera, other than we think they phoned it in, but we're going to get more on that uh, a little bit yeah, later we'll on. Get more, we'll get more okay. into it. My, my overall feeling was that that was a, a, a big opportunity that just came up short. It okay. was fourth and one, and you came up short. Okay, so... In terms of competition, this is where this gets really interesting because uh -huh. they come out with cameras that don't really have direct competitors, right? The the only competition is whatever's priced similarly, and that's not necessarily reflective of like true competition, but I think about it's similarly priced competition and I would go, I would just buy that camera right now. Okay, so to me I I made a list here of some cameras that are kind of in that world like the Sigma yeah. FP, which mm -hmm. Is a crazy powerful camera, very quirky, a little bit older now too. You can talk about Sony cameras like the FX3, FX30. You can talk about, I guess, the R5C, sort of. If you're talking Canon, it's probably the closest thing. Yeah, that's pretty. I mean, that's like an extra grand. I know, I know. But, all right, so what about Kinefinity? What about the S5 II though? Yeah, what yeah, S5 S5 II. S5 II, S5 II X, I think are really solidly similar because they're both full frame. They have, like, especially the S5-2X with the SSD recording, the RAW, like, all that stuff, um, I think is probably its closest competitor. And that's the one I would get. Okay. Yeah. You'd get, you'd get the S5-2X? That's X. just me. Yeah, you're going to get a similar image. I think the cinema camera, the, the Blackmagic, has a better image. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've never used it. But their old stuff, I would say, has a better image. But other than that, like the S5 II kind of like beats it in every other category for me, other than screen brightness and menu but and I.O., you know, but you can easily overcome that with a few things. Yeah, I'd be really curious once the camera starts shipping and more than like three people have used it and made content about it to see yeah. what, what the image looks like. Because from what I've seen, it looks like the image quality looks incredible on the new camera. Josh, you should borrow one and do a comparison to your 6K. I've already requested it, so if if I do oh, get it, have yeah. you? All right. Yes. Sorry yes, if I, I killed a future video. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, the video will still it, the, the video will still happen. I did ask yeah. to request it, but it's a matter of like if okay, they're available cool. and because I don't get yeah. them pre-shipped. I you know I have a relationship with B and H to let me borrow stuff. They've been awesome, yeah. so um, I would love to try it and see. I would like I'd love to put it up against like the Komodo or the FX3, just image quality wise, sort of see how yeah. it does. You know. Okay, cool. Um, other competitors I mentioned, like Kinefinity and Zcam, I think of kind of in that world as well. I don't know much the about Z those cameras. The Zcam for sure. Again, I have a hard time like comparing it to a Kinefinity, any recent Kinefinity, just because the price difference is so big. Sure. Uh, you also talk about the like a used Lumix S1H or maybe the BS1H. So yeah. if you want to be in that Lumix world. Yeah. Um, there's some stuff, but like, there's no direct competitor to this camera. It's like a very unique camera. It is for sure. Okay, so after we sort of wrapped up our thoughts on this camera and where it fits in the market, which I don't know how much it disrupts things based on like 
features and, and price because there are a lot of other options out there too. And maybe that's kind of why it's not as much of a disruptor because we have yeah. cameras like the S52X or we have, you know, like these other cameras that we're talking about. Um, one thing which you pointed out earlier, which is really interesting, and this sort of goes into our discussion about Blackmagic as a company, is that all of their cameras come with DaVinci Resolve Studio in terms of the mm -hmm. license. And yeah. if you buy that, which I did uh, like a couple years ago, it's $300. I don't know if it's yeah. still $300. And so this is absolutely fascinating to me because one thing that I think they're just absolutely brilliant about is they're getting people into the Resolve workflow. And mm -hmm. if you are using Blackmagic cameras, of course, you're using B-RAW. You're, and if you work in the ATEM Mini system, there's all those other cool features that happen with the black with the pocket cameras and how it integrates. I don't know if you know about all that stuff, but you can like, mm -mm. you can do multicam uh, video and with you can ISO record and it'll trigger B-RAW recording in the cameras. It'll create a wow. DaVinci Resolve edit file for you. You bring in the computer and it's all, all the proxies are all set up. You just plug in your SSDs and you can just let it rip and it's like you're editing B-RAW and it already has all wow. the cuts saved for you. So there's a lot of cool stuff like that, which is not really our world, um, yeah. but What's cool is like getting people into Resolve, which I think is kind of their strategy moving forward is more of a software company and focusing on other stuff. So what's brilliant about Resolve, and I wanna talk about that for a minute because them giving that away for free is one of the smartest things that company has done. Yep. And I think back to like when, was it Photoshop was kind of like the thing that everyone was using like in colleges and they were getting started and that's how people got sucked into the Adobe suite was like they got used to a certain application. Like I started on Resolve because when I went out and looked at software, it was the free one. And I was like, well, yeah. I'll just use that, it's free. And then you're like, oh, mm -hmm. buy the other one. And then you're in that system. Uh, Resolve has been a huge part of um, what's going on there. And the other thing which you mentioned earlier about the Blackmagic app, which just came out at the launch of the 6K was lining up with the iPhone 15 release, which is a huge release for filmmakers and photographers and enthusiasts and stuff. And I think it really showed like, they were like probably just as excited about the app, if not more, spend more time talking about that than the camera. And I yeah. think that really shows like how much they're shifting their, you know, what they're focusing on. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you think that's true as well? Or is that just my opinion about yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, that's why we kind of came up with the title. Like, I think they see more promise in some of the other products rather than their cameras. They're like, you know, if we focus on these few things that we're already kind of crushing, we can crush even harder. So, yeah, even though I'm disappointed, I understand and I would agree. Like, DaVinci Resolve is crushing it. The, the app release coinciding with the iPhone 15 was massive. I've seen so many people that are starting to use the iPhone 15 as like their main camera. It makes sense. Like that's the best app you can possibly get for recording video on an iPhone 15 and it's free, so. Yeah, again, getting people into the Blackmagic ecosystem, getting their feet wet, getting them comfortable with the products and then go, oh, if you wanna edit this in Resolve, yeah, You know, like, I think it's sort of funneling people towards their software. I'm wondering if Resolve will eventually become a, you know, a monthly fee or yearly fee kind of software. You know, I mean, that's just, you, you, you look at the history of things and you're like, yes, almost every, you know, company eventually takes their service monthly because in, the, the people on the board start demanding that they have money coming in all the time. And so... I would think it would, I think it does, but you know, like everybody else that uses, like, please don't. Yeah. So the other part of the company, which I know most of us aren't talking about or thinking about often are all the switchers and the broadcast equipment. And I did get nerdy about that stuff for a little bit and try to understand what was going on. Cause I was trying to upgrade my live stream stuff. And once you get your, your nose in that world and think about like all the different switch, they make some crazy stuff that like way above what I need. Uh, oh, yeah. And there are people using that stuff on very professional situations and, you know, uh, like house of worship stuff and broadcast and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, there's a whole other world out there. And it seems like just where their emphasis was during that that announcement, I was like, OK, like a little bit about cameras, but really we're going to talk about our switchers and we're going to talk about our app and resolve. Uh, in addition to that, resolve like is constantly improving. We're constantly we're like the two of us edit in Final Cut and we're just like anything, anything like it would be cool 
it would be super cool if we got some cool new stuff. And it yeah. always goes to Da Vinci. So, back to your question, which you talked about earlier. Are we going to see more development in the Black Magic cinema camera world? Or is I, this kind of where we're going right now? I mean, I think we will. I, I don't think they're going to stop making cinema cameras. But do I see another camera in the immediate future that's like a more pro version of this camera? I don't think so. Okay. So do you think there'll be another round maybe in a few years that's like a wholly different design? Or like you just think they're going to iterate on this for a while? Well, not. I think so. I think they have to. I think if they're smart, they're gonna they're gonna see like, hey, like, we need a refresh, right? Like we worked this, we milked it for as long as possible. People are really demanding something different, a box. So I think, yeah, I think either they kill it or they have to like change. I've always thought of Black Magic was a hardware company to sell you hardware so you could use their software. That's kind of how I always felt, like them including the Resolve license or all those advantages be like, oh, but if you edit and Resolve, this is like so much easier. So you get these like cheap hardware devices, like the A10 Minis, for example. Some of them are incredibly cheap for what they do and outperform their like rack mounted stuff in a lot of ways. And it's like, I mean, I have like the original A10 Mini, the HDMI one, and it is absolutely my go-to like live switcher. Yeah, it works I'm using so it, well. I'm using it right now to communicate with you and do all my live streaming too. I'm using the, the original one, like the doesn't even have the recording or anything like that in it. So yeah, same. Yeah. So it was like I think 200 bucks. Yeah, and so that's where I feel like their magic is. Is they're like, hey, we have some cool hardware, but really want to get you in the software world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's gonna be interesting when they after they launch this product and they take a look at the sales, I wonder if that's going to change their mind into if they put more or less energy into their hardware design for cameras. Yeah, you bring up a good point because in my own mind, I see sales of the cinema camera being less than expected for them. And then they go, do we just stop this? Do we abandon it? Or do we like go hard and try to bring those back up? It'll be interesting. I just feel like everyone in the company is like, every day, every week, someone's walking from the camera side of the company over to the software side. And there's not many camera <laughs> dudes left over there. <laughs> yeah, probably. They're all, they're all going over to the software side. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I think. So we'd love to see some new cameras from Blackmagic. One thing I would love to see them develop, finally, is 4K versions of their switchers, their A10 minis. We need to see 4K versions of those. I think that would go a long way. Dude, I would I would be so pumped if they came out with a 4K. I would love to see a 4K switcher that has both HDMI and SDI because I have, you know, two SDIs, but also got a, an HDMI camera. It would be nice to integrate all of them. I hate that you have to pick one or the other. Or use the adapters, which you can, like the uh, yeah. Yeah. little boxes. I have, yeah, I have one of those, but, I mean, just, like, make it easy on me. Yeah. Uh, anything else you'd like to see them make? I mean, it seems like they're pushing hard in the software world, but... A box camera? A box camera, yeah. okay. Box camera. So let me ask you this, Brandon. If they came out with a box version of the new 6K, would you buy one? Yeah. You're the one over it here complaining be... about a box camera. Are you going to buy one? Yeah, it would be tempting. It would be tempting because I like I, I enjoyed it. There, Like, I will be the first to say, like, I kind of romanticized that experience with the 6k pro i really did love that camera when i got rid of it it was kind of like a gut punch i was like oh man there's even as awkward as as it was and as cheaply as it was made i still really enjoyed it like i loved picking it up i loved shooting with it and so i've always tried to get back there and the prospect of maybe getting something like that in a form factor i i really like for 2500 bucks three grand like yeah sure but also, like, the smart person in me, which is a very small section of my brain, is like, dude, you have a Komodo X and a Komodo. Like, you have two box cameras that it just can't compete with. So, I mean, it would be, it'd be fun to test it out. Maybe that's what I'll say. I, I would I would get one. I would love to test it, but I, I can't see myself buying one unless it was, like, just crazy, you know? So, it's interesting that you bring that up because you, maybe you're romanticizing a little bit about the camera because that was a point of your career or your path where you were 
learning, you're experimenting, you are starting to get some really cool images and maybe sort of that's what's connecting you to black magic. And I think for a lot of people, maybe I'm misspeaking here, Brandon, but I think that's kind of the place for you with the cameras in your in your path, right? For sure, but I also, I mean, I had a C70 and a Komodo at the time and I liked the Komodo image the best and then the 6K Pro's image, then the C70s. So but I really you sold was the like, 6K. But you sold the 6K before you sold the C70. Yes, for sure. Again, like I was just filming myself so much, like it yeah. didn't make sense to have all of those. And like the C70 was just so easy. So, yeah, I do think it, it offers a lot of people value. It offers a lot of people the ability to get to a really high level image quality with maybe some inconveniences or things they have to deal with um, or maybe not as good. Yeah. Build build quality and, and those sorts of things. Yep. I would agree. Like uh, I still find myself recommending like the 4K and the 6K Pro to people that are like, I want really good image quality, but I don't have a lot of money but they don't want like a hybris mirrorless a hi did i say a hybridless a hybrid mirrorless, mirrorless. camera yeah you meant to do term like, today i also you're think welcome. you're welcome everybody i think like before we try to wrap this up ran and there's also i feel like some people look down on black magic a little bit um in terms of why. like I don't know why either, but i think it's like because it's like the cheaper version of something else they're like oh but you're using black magic like, oh, do you weird. see, yeah, I don't know if you've heard like that sort of thought from people, so. No, those people are stupid. So do you see, uh, like, are are there a lot of people out there using Blackmagic cameras that you know of in terms of like production and stuff like that? Like, I, I, I'm not in that world so much, so I don't know how much is being used out there, you know? Yeah, I don't know, but like there, you know, there's a couple of people that I've followed for a really long time that do incredibly high level stuff that use black magic. So I think probably the go to is what's his name, Matteo Bertoli, like the Italian guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he's kind of, you know, he's definitely up there. And then what's the British dude, James? Is his name James, the really, really funny guy? Uh, he's used black magic forever. He's done huge productions. Like some of his stuff looks absolutely incredible. I can't remember his name right oh, now. Oh, I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny freaking dude. He's done a ton of stuff with like DJI and everything. And he films everything on like a 6K or a 4K and his stuff has looked incredible. So I don't know why anybody would be like, oh, you're on a black magic. That sucks. It's like they compete with anything out there. Agreed. So, well, I just think there's a, there's some people that are like, well, you're using that because you can't afford a bread, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, but that's a thing. Like, some people don't have the money to buy red, and you should never feel bad just because you're not in a financial position where you can't. Yeah. And from my personal experience, now having used all these cameras, I picked up the 6K, and I'm absolutely, like, impressed with the image quality that comes out. Like, now that I understand more about all this, as I'm further down my my path i'm just like mm -hmm. wow why have i not been using this camera more in the past you know what i mean yeah so all right well i think we uh we've decided if they phoned it in or not on this release uh <laughs> i think i definitely want to know what people think about i want to see who's like super pissed about them not building a box camera or like hey if you have the new cinema camera let us know what you think about it like have you been stoked with it given all of the omissions i'd like to know yeah, also, if you're like, maybe I should give Blackmagic a try because I wanted full, I was waiting for full frame or mm -hmm. or mirrorless mount or whatever. Are you upgrading from the 6K or 6K Pro or whatever? Um, I'd be curious about who's in the market for this camera and, you know, if some people are going to be buying them and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. All righty. All right. So that kind of wraps up our Blackmagic talk, Brandon. That was fun. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of fun. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate everyone watching. Again, thanks for all the support. It's been a blast. We're going to keep cruising along with this, and uh, we'll see you guys real soon. Peace. Peace.